Welcome to another midweek lesson from Grace Christian Assembly. Open your Bible and join us as we dig into the Word. Now, here's our teacher, Jim McClarty. As I just told all of you, and I'll say it again so all the internet folk hear it and the folks who uh, locally listen, Elder Barney Johnson will be here a week from Sunday, which is the 21st of October, and we're excited to have him here. I uh, don't know how many of you saw today's Smyrna AM paper. Anybody get the Smyrna AM? If you live in the Smyrna area, it's delivered to your mailbox automatically. A couple months ago, the editor of the Smyrna AM paper had asked local pastors and ministers if they'd be willing to submit articles. And the editor there has been very kind and encouraging and looking for more material. So I had just gotten an email from Elder Tillman up in Cleveland, our good friend, and he was commenting on our current series that we're doing on Sunday mornings where we've been talking about Christian life and this combination of sound doctrine producing Christian life. And Elder Tillman said, I see now very clearly that proper theology leads to proper life. And I said, ooh, I like that, and I just stole it from you. <laughs> and so now that he knew it had been absconded with, I sat down and wrote this article, which I called Theology Matters, which Smyrna AM re-entitled, Theology Equals Education, Not Entertainment. I don't know if that's a snappier title or not, but that's what they went with. So uh, page seven of today's Smyrna AM, we got the whole page there, so that's nice. A lovely photo of my little mug, and then, um, and then of course at the end, all of the information about GCA, where we are, when we meet, the website address, and that went into every mailbox in Smyrna today. So that's a positive. So here's the article. I actually posted a link to it on my uh, blog today. So anybody who's hearing this out on the internet who wants to have a look at it. Theology Matters is what it was actually entitled. I get a lot of email. Due to the popularity of our website, I receive comments and observations from a wide range of denominations and countries. One of the most consistent themes emerging from my inbox is the general lack of doctrine and theology being taught in most churches. In its place, churches offer showmanship, clowns, puppets, light shows, theatrical productions, surround sound, smoke machines, rock bands, etc. An elemental shift has occurred in the contemporary church. According to the Bible, although the followers of Christ are in the world, we are not to be of the world. We are called to reflect the principles and teaching of Christ as salt and light in an otherwise decaying and dark environment. But as church buildings and budgets have grown, churches have begun competing with the world over the disposable income people spend on entertainment. And in the process, doctrine and theology have suffered. So, does that really matter? I mean, what's the point of theology anyway? Is doctrine really that important? The word theology is a contraction of two Greek words, meaning words about God. The Bible is full of such words. As you learn the Bible, you learn what God is like, how he thinks, how he acts, and what it takes to approach him. It's not enough to simply think about God. It matters what you think about God. Proper theology teaches you how to think about God properly. In his epistles, the Apostle Paul urged the church repeatedly to concentrate on sound doctrine. That means solid teaching. They were not to merely imagine what Christ was like or what he taught. They were to devote themselves to the solid, provable teaching handed down to them by the apostles. Proper theology leads to proper Christianity. Biblical theology answers the most pressing, important question any of us will ever face. How can sinners stand forgiven and uncondemned before a righteous, holy God? Given that we are all mortal and that the ratio of death so far is a perfect one for one, what you think about God's salvation is a very important consideration. 
proper theology leads to peace with God. And finally, once we understand our relationship with God and His Son, that knowledge affects every aspect of our lives. How we treat people, how we raise our kids, how we live in society, and how we treat our marriage are all directly impacted by a genuine understanding of our position before God. In other words, proper theology leads to a proper life. So does theology matter? Yes, in fact, there is no other subject in this lifetime that will have a greater impact on your eternal destiny than the words you say about God. So theology matters. Amen. I'm kind of surprised they printed that. I'm very pleased they printed that. When I read it today to Megan while she was driving in the car, we had just picked up the paper, and I said, oh, good. Oh, they printed this. She says, oh, what's it say? And I read it to her. We got done, and she said, no, boy, the pastor up the street's not going to like that one. And I said, no, I don't imagine First Baptist is going to be pleased. And, and she said, but who could disagree with it? Hmm? How, do you argue with it? How do you argue with that? What's their argument going to be? No, theology doesn't matter. That's the only argument you've got. So I'm doubting that argument's going to carry much weight. No, you won't make that argument. It'll be the statements about the competing Right, right, it'll get me in trouble, but you know, controversy is my mother tongue. <laughs> and uh, so. I, I was seeing your, your email box getting flamed as that one was written. <laughs> but you know what? For the people like the folks who were drawn by the last article, uh -huh. that's who I'm looking for anyway. Yeah. I'm looking for the people who will read that and go, finally, somebody said that out loud. <laughs> well, those are the folks I want anyway, so come on in. The ones who will flame me aren't going to listen anyway. So, but I think the more times that we get that uh, salvation by grace and GCA name and information out there, the more aware Smyrna as a community is going to become of us and who we are and what we do. And that's really the point. It's very nice that we have this website that reaches people you know, around the country and around the globe. But I would like to reach Smyrna. I would like to let the people in this community know who we are and what we do. So these kind of efforts are very helpful in that. Exodus 5. We're actually in Exodus 6 for the newest information. What we're going to see tonight is the beginning of the plagues. And the first couple of signs that God gave Moses and Aaron to do as you may recall, are the things like throwing down your staff and it's going to become a snake. But these first couple of signs are not going to be particularly impressive to Pharaoh and his very hard heart because he's going to have his magicians come in and do similar tricks, but then God's going to prove that his was the superior one. But as the plagues begin to accumulate, by the time you get to the frogs, which is the third of the plagues, by the time you hit the frogs, Pharaoh begins seeing that there's actually something going on here beyond what his magicians can actually pull off. It's interesting, as I was reading through this chapter again this week, there was a TV show on TBN. Were you the one that called me about this? No, well, you don't know yet, do you? <laughs> oh, <laughs> someone called me um, because I had just seen it too. There was a magician on one of the religious stations, I think it was TBN, and he was recreating biblical miracles with magic tricks as an entertainment program. So he was doing walking on the water, and he was producing da 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 frog. And then he wrapped it up with a very bizarre altar call that included, well, I'm just a magician, and these were just tricks. But God, when God does them, you know, it's for real, which I found a very, very unconvincing argument because it is the same argument that you're going to see tonight where God is going to do miraculous things like turn the Nile into blood. And then Pharaoh's magicians are going to come out and do something similar, not as good, but a similar trick. I mean, I've seen plenty of magicians who do the Hey, it's clear water, but when I pour it into this glass, it's red now. Da-da. 
And we've, we've all seen those kind of tricks our whole life, so we're not impressed by it anymore. And I'd like to see their impersonation of the flaming hail. Yeah, the flaming hail is going to be a tough one to pull off, yeah. So this is exactly what we're seeing here, is that the magicians and soothsayers are saying, well, that's not that big a trick. Watch, we'll do it too. So I thought it was interesting that there was a magician on a religious program doing magic tricks that aped the miracles of the Bible so that he could then say, but these are just tricks, but when God does them, they're for real. Well, my goodness, that's the way Egypt thinks. That's the way Pharaoh thinks. That shouldn't be on Christian TV. So let's start at the end of chapter 5. There's a little argument going on here between God and Moses. And once Moses has gone and said to Pharaoh, let the people go, Pharaoh's response has been, well, then give the Israelites no straw, but tell them they have to make the same number of bricks, but they have to go find their own straw. And if the number goes down, of course, they're going to suffer and the beatings raise up. And when Moses finally goes and sees the children of Israel, starting in verse 21, they said to him, may the Lord look upon you and judge you. They're not happy about what's happened here. For you have made us odious in Pharaoh's sight and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you brought harm to this people? Why did you ever send me? It was not working out the way Moses thought it should have. Moses thought that he would walk in and say, hey, God sent me. Watch, here's a snake, here's some blood, there we're gone. And the people of Israel would all say, Moses is the best. We love Moses, that's great. Instead, the way it went is that he went in and professed God's word and things got immediately worse for him. And so, he argues in verse 23, ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done harm to this people, and you, look at this accusation, and you have not delivered your people at all. You told me to go say, let my people go. I did that, and you haven't delivered your people. What an accusation. It is in response to that accusation that we're going to read the first half of chapter 16. And God's response to the accusation, you have not delivered your people, is God is going to argue for his own faithfulness. He's going to start with who he is. And that is the beginning of why we should trust in the faithfulness of God. There's a great deal of theology, because theology matters. There's a great deal of theology that we can draw from this speech God is going to make here about himself. This is God's defense of himself. And so we really ought to pay attention. When God decides he's going to tell you something about himself, you need to sit up and listen. Then the Lord said to Moses, chapter 6, verse 1, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. He said, Pharaoh made it harder for your people. You have not delivered them. God's answer is, uh, remember I told you I was going to harden Pharaoh's heart? And remember I told you that he wouldn't let them go except under great compulsion. Remember all that? Well, now watch what I do to Pharaoh. Now, one more time, I guess I have to point out, and I'm going to point it out a lot tonight. From verse 2 all the way through verse 13, God is going to say, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Somebody keep track, in fact, as we go through this. And we'll count the number of times that God says, I will. I will. And it's the only will God is concerned with. God says, I will. He does not say, if Pharaoh wills to let you go, then I won't have to do anything terrible to him. Instead, he says, you just stand back and watch what I do to Pharaoh. He doesn't say, I'm going to check with Pharaoh. Maybe Pharaoh will listen. Instead, he says, I'm just going to keep hardening his heart. And it's going to get a whole lot worse. And I'm going to get glory in all the terrible things I'm going to bring down on Pharaoh because I will to do that. He never says to Moses, Moses, if you will, if you choose, if you decide, you can go in and be my mouthpiece. God says, I will send you. I will deliver my people. I will be their God. They will be my people. Absolute sovereign declarations. I will do these things. Why? 
because I'm God. So he says, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. There's the first one, number one. This is what I will do. For under compulsion, he will let them go, and under compulsion, he shall drive them out of his land. In other words, not only is he going to let them go, he's going to force them out. He's going to push them out of the land. Because remember earlier, he had already told Moses, tell all the women to go and get everything they can from their neighbors. They're going to want you gone so badly once I've killed all the firstborn that they'll give you clothing, they'll give you riches, they'll give you gold, they'll take their jewelry off, they'll give you anything just to get rid of you. And God is saying, watch Moses, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Now he explains why he's going to do it. Verse 2, God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I told you a couple weeks ago, that is Yahweh, that is Jehovah. This is God now beginning to reveal who he is, what he's like. He's about to say, when it came to Abraham and Isaac, when it came to Jacob, when it came to your fathers, I made them promises. I promised them the land. I promised them I'd bring their descendants back. I promised them all that stuff, but I did it all under a previous name. And the name that I gave them was that I am God Almighty. But that's not the name I'm giving you now. Instead, I'm giving you this name, Jehovah. New news about me, new information I'm going to reveal about myself. I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob as God Almighty. That's who I appeared as. Now, that's why he's been identified all the way through the book of Genesis and the early part of Exodus as the God who made heaven and earth. Doesn't that sound real familiar now? That's the way he's identified himself all the way through the first book of the Pentateuch. The God who made heaven and earth. God Almighty. This is the God who is the one who has all the power. This is the God who does whatever he wants, whenever he wants. This is El Shaddai, which is exactly what the Hebrew term is translated here. God Almighty is El Shaddai. It's the God who does what he wants to do because he has all the power. And all his power is demonstrated by the fact that he made everything. So he says, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I was known as God Almighty. That's all they knew me as. But now, I'm going to reveal myself further to you. I was known as God Almighty, but by my name, Jehovah, I did not make myself known to them. Isn't that interesting? So now God is saying, I'm going to begin revealing more about myself, about my mercy, about grace, about my love, about the fact that I am the God that saves that I am the enough God, that I am the God that heals, that I am all of those Jehovah names that are all revelatory names that each show some character, some aspect, some attribute of God that God is revealing at that particular moment and then assigns himself that name and says, at this moment, I want you to know what I'm like. I'm the enough God. I'm Jehovah Ashu. I'm the God that saves. I am Jehovah Nishi. I am your banner the banner under which you'll march into war. I'm the God that is all these wonderful attributes and characteristics. So he says to the forefathers, I wasn't known by that name, but by my name, Jehovah, that's how I'm going to make myself known now. And I also, verse 4, established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourned. And furthermore... I have heard the groanings of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage and I have remembered my covenant. So this is all in response to God, ever since I went to Pharaoh, you have not delivered them. And he comes back and says, let me tell you what I have done. I have revealed myself in new ways. I have made a promise. I have established a covenant. I am going to give them that land. I am aware of the affliction of my people. 
I am active in all of this. In other words, Moses, while you're busy accusing me of not doing things, I am actually very active in doing precisely what I told the forefathers I would do. And do you remember at the burning bush, I told you this is the way it would play out? Okay, well, it is playing out that way because I will do things my way. Now he launches into, I will. Say, therefore, verse 6, Say, therefore, to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord. In most of your translations, that'll be the capital L-O-R-D. Whenever you see that in the Old Testament, it's a translation of the tetragrammaton. Use it in a sentence later. It just means four letters. That's all tetragrammaton means. They could have just said the four letters. The Y-H-W-H Yahweh name, which has been transliterated into the name Jehovah so that it can be pronounced. So say to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord Jehovah, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So they're complaining. Wow, it just got harder. We believed you that we were going to be delivered, and then everything got worse. Now we have to get our own straw. Now the beatings have increased. Now we're mad at Moses. Then Moses is mad at God. And then God responds and says, I will do it. Then, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver them from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Do you see that part of it? You can see God saying, you know, if you just marched in there and said, let my people go, and Pharaoh said, yeah, all right then everybody would go, well, that was an odd moment Pharaoh had. And hey, look, there go all the Israelites. And it would have been a glitch in history. It would have been the moment that the Pharaoh lost his mind and let his slaves go. But God said, I'm going to do this in such a way that I get great glory to myself. And part of that glory is going to be seen in the way I deliver and redeem my people with a mighty hand and in the way that I judge their captors. Both of those are going to bring glory to God, and so I will do this in that way. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Do you see the two sides of God's character there? I will redeem my people. That's a very gracious thing he's doing. That's a very faithful thing he's doing. That's God redeeming his people because he said he would. Followed with and great judgments. And the same God does them both. I'm going to judge these people because they're my enemies. I'm going to redeem these people because they're my people. And I keep asking the same question over and over. So tonight we'll ask Sam. Everybody look at Sam. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> everybody, Sam, Sam, everybody. <laughs> okay, so Sam, Israel are God's people, Egypt are not called God's people. How did Israel become God's people? They drew salt. <laughs> or, <laughs> God chose them. I'm trying to... Yeah, it's one or the other. <laughs> yeah, you're stuck with God chose them, aren't you? All the way from Abraham, in Ur of the Chaldees, son of an idol worshiper, an idol worshiper himself, son of an idol maker, when suddenly God shows up and says, leave your dad, leave your household, go to a land, I'll show it to you. I'm going to give it to your descendants, and I'm going to do all this because I want to. Nowhere does God offer a reason or a rationale for why Abraham, other than, I chose you. And then because he promised Abraham that his descendants were going to come back to that land after 400 years, God's here keeping that promise. And he's about to say, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Now, when the God who has already said to the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I revealed myself to them by the name El Shaddai, God Almighty. When the God who says, I'm God Almighty, says, I will be your God, he's going to be your God. That's how that's going to work. When the God who has already said, I'm the God who has all the power, when he says, you will be my people, you will be his people. He has all the power. That is the exact same God choosing, deciding, willing 
and then exercising his superior, almighty, sovereign will back here in Exodus that we saw early in Genesis that we find at the end of the book of Revelation and in all the books in between. And he always works the same way. He does what he wants to do when he wants to do it because he's God. And nowhere does he ever say, there are so many things I would like to do. I have this laundry list of stuff I would love to get around to. But darn those people, they just won't cooperate. If I could just get a few people to choose me, pick me, do it my way, then I could get so much done. But that lack of cooperation, never. Listen to this statement. Listen to the power of it. Listen to a God who has already said, I am God Almighty. Listen to him say, Say this to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgment. Does it sound like God is in any way vague or confused about his intention? No. Nope. This is a God who knows what he's doing. He is not waiting around for anybody to decide anything. He's exercising his will and saying, I will. Verse 7, it continues. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Now, we know the end of the story. We know he actually does all that. But at this moment, they don't know he's going to do all that. They're still worrying. They're still going, oh, we've got to make all these bricks. We're still in slavery. We're still in bondage. Moses is still standing there arguing, hey, I went and did everything you said for me to do, and so far you haven't delivered your people. So there's all this lack of faith on behalf of the people. You see no faithfulness coming from Israel at this moment. Does that in any way keep God from doing what God wants to do? Not at all. Not at all. We know the end of the story. He does it all anyway, including they will be my people. I'm glad to know that the faithlessness of human beings does not stop God from doing what God has willed to do because he has willed to save a people for his glory. He has willed to give a people to his son to worship his son eternally to the glory of the son and they are going to be vessels of mercy, vessels of grace set up in heaven so that God can point to them forever and say, look what I did. Not because they were good, not because they were faithful, not because they were righteous, but because I will. I will do that. I'm God. And these declarations I find so comforting because he doesn't say, if Israel will choose to follow me, I will be their God. So, something, something I was thinking about as you were saying this is, you know, not only in this scenario does God's power and His grace and mercy shine even more uh, in the face of this unbelief and lack of cooperation by His people, but, you know, as you look at the world today, you know, and grieve over the sin that you see around you, you know, it's, um, you know, another thought that we can have about that to say, well, how much more is heaven going to shine? in the face of all that is now mm -hmm. that God's going to accomplish in spite of this. In spite of this. Yes. And that's the point. God is God. He does what he wants to do in spite of all this. So verse 7, I will take you for my people. I will be your God. And you will know that I am the Lord your God. I, I would like to apply that to all of us. Uh, I like the God who says, I have chosen you. You will be my people. I will be your God. And that's the way that's going to work. And you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Look at verse 8. And I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Isn't the phrase, I am the Lord, at the end of that, like a great big exclamation mark? Yeah. It's like, who do you think you're dealing with? I will do all this, Moses. You're busy telling me, Moses, oh, you haven't delivered your people. And God is saying, I haven't even gotten started. 
I'm just beginning. I got plagues to do. I got a bunch of stuff that's going to bring glory to myself. I'm going to deliver them with a mighty hand. I'm going to show great judgments. I'm about to do something that, oh, 3,400 years from now, roughly, people will still talk about in Smyrna, Tennessee. They'll still be talking about That's how big what I'm about to do is. That for the rest of humanity, people will know about the Exodus. That's one thing they're going to know about. Oh, they'll make movies about it. They'll talk about it. There will even be people who will try to disprove it. That's how big what I'm about to do is. It's going to shake up all of humanity and all of mankind. That's how big this is. And he says, and I will do it. And I will do it in such a way that I get the glory. I will bring you to the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why? Because I did swear to do it. And I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. So Moses spoke thus to the sons of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses on account of their despondency and their cruel bondage. Moses goes back and says, listen, God said, I'm going to do all these things. I talked last week about, in fact, I put a chair up here, and we got the lovely Carrie to come up here and discuss whether sitting or not sitting in the chair constituted faith. But I'm going to make the same point here much more briefly this week, that here are people who are receiving a direct word from God via his chosen mouthpiece, and they can't hear it and won't hear it because their circumstances are different than what God said. So God said, I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to take you to your land. Trust me, it's flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to take care of it. And the people now twice have rejected the word of God at the mouth of Moses because their circumstances drove them to not hear it. And it's exactly what Moses writes here. And I don't think it's any mistake that he points out very specifically. They did not listen to Moses on account of their despondent attitude and their cruel bondage. They looked at their circumstances and said, oh, I know what God said, but my circumstances are more real to me than God's word. Faith says God's word is more real to me than my circumstances. That even when the circumstances of life get hard, the God who said, I've loved you with an everlasting love, didn't change. Nothing changed about the relationship. Your circumstances changed. But God, his character, his nature, who he is, what he's like, his plan for you, his ultimate goal for you, his determination to save you, his redemptive power and ability, none of that changed. Your circumstances changed. But during those circumstances, he's going to teach you to trust him. He's going to teach you what faith is. And faith becomes, for lack of a better term, the trading commodity for which God gives you righteousness. That when you trust God, believe God, God accounts that to you as righteousness. And so he's going to make sure to build into you, to plant and grow in you, a genuine dependency and faith in him. And we don't do that when things are going good. We just don't do that when it's easy. That's when we're busy jumping up and down talking about how good we have it and how well we did. And pointing to other people and saying, if you buy my book, you can do it too. Because I did it. And just because I had a real good turn in life, I'm now going to believe I did it. And create a formula for how you can do it too. For only $19.95. So Moses spoke this to the sons of Israel, and they did not listen to Moses on account of their despondency and the cruel bondage. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Go tell Pharaoh the king of Egypt, to let the sons of Israel go out of his land. Now, you would think that by now, Moses would be saying, I'm with you now, God, I got it. You're going to be God no matter what. I mean, I've seen the burning bush thing. I saw me put my hand in my cloak, take it out. Hey, leprous, put it back, not. I've seen the stick snake thing. You're the voice of God speaking to me. And so by now, you would think Moses would go, just tell me what you want, God. I'm right there with you. Hanging tough. But this consistent personality profile of Moses, he's going to continue arguing. 
Go tell Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to let the sons of Israel go out of his land. But Moses spoke before the Lord, saying, Behold, the sons of Israel have not listened to me. There you go. Circumstance, circumstance, circumstance. I went and told them what you said. I thought they would all just go, hey, all right. And they didn't. This is not working, God. I am not happy. The sons of Israel have not listened to me. How then will Pharaoh listen to me? For I am unskilled in speech. There's his excuse. I'd like to do it your way, God, but I'm unskilled in speech. Now, do you think this comes as a surprise to the same God who back there at the burning bush when Moses said, I'm slow of tongue? Remember God's argument? Who makes man's tongue? Or who makes a man hearing or seeing or blind? I, the Lord, do all these things. And so now he brings up the same old argument that didn't work before. That's how desperate he is for an argument. And he says, I, I'm not good at speaking. And since I'm unskilled as a speaker and I couldn't convince the Israelites, how am I going to convince Pharaoh? He's not going to listen to me. So I think, once again, we're going to see that the power here is not in Moses. It's interesting that God would pick a guy who is not only this argumentative and hot-headed and difficult and temperamental, but also a guy who recognizes, I have no ability here. And yet to this day, we think of Moses as the great leader in Israel. And he's a guy that God picked and said, yeah, I know you got nothing going for yourself, which is not the way we think of Moses. But instead, he argues, I'm unskilled in speech. Then the Lord said to Moses, and now look at the next phrase, and to Aaron. It's almost like God goes, okay, I've had enough of that. Look, Aaron, here's what we're going to do. <laughs> The Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron and gave them a charge to the sons of Israel and to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Now, at this moment, Moses launches into a short genealogy, and he's only going to mention the three eldest sons of Israel because he wants to establish that these two guys, Moses and Aaron in particular, are sons of Levi. He wants to establish their lineage to prove that not only are they Israelites, but that they are Levites. And especially if you consider that he's writing at the end of his life, he's writing at a vantage point where he realizes that God is keeping all these things and starts chronicling all the stuff that took place. He has the advantage of looking back over it. And so he realizes that this would be a good moment to prove to everybody that they belong to the very tribe that God is later going to pick specifically to be priests and intercessors. And that only from the tribe of Levi can a priest or a high priest or, or a Levite come. And so Moses is going to take a moment here and throw out a bunch of difficult to pronounce names in order to establish his lineage as being a Levite and therefore being qualified to stand between Israel and God because God is later going to pick that only the Levites can do that. These are the heads of their father's households. The sons of Reuben, Israel's firstborn, are Hanak and Palu, Hezron and Carmi. These are the families of Reuben. And the sons of Simeon, Jemuel and Jamin and Ohad, and Jekin and Zohar and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman, these are the families of Simeon. And these are the names of the sons of Levi according to their generations. Gershon and Kohath and Merari. And the length of Levi's life was 137 days. And the sons of Gershon were Libri and Shimei according to their families. And the sons of Kohath are Amram and Izhar and Hebron, and Uziel, and the length of Kohath's life was 133 years. And the sons of Merari are Mali and Mushi. These are the families of the Levites according to their generations. And Amram married his father's sister, Jochebed, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. And the length of Amram's life was 137 years. And the sons of Izhar were Korah, and Nepheg, and Zikri. And the sons of Uziel 
are Mishael and Elzaphan and Sithri. And Aaron married Elisheba, the daughter of Aminadab, the sister of Nashan, and she bore him Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. Those are names that should be familiar to you. They're going to come up later. And the sons of Korah, that's another group of people we're going to hear about later in the Exodus. And the sons of Korah are Asir and Elkanah and Abiasaph. And these are the families of the Korahites. And Aaron's sons are Eleazar. Eleazar married one of the daughters of Putiel, and she bore Phinehas. And these are the heads of the father's households of the Levites, according to their families. And it was the same Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, bring out the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt, according to their hosts. They were the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, about bringing out the sons of Israel from Egypt. It was the same Moses and Aaron. So Moses took the time to really drive that point home. This is the Moses and Aaron that are direct descendants of Levi. And therefore, when God later picks the Levites as the tribe to serve him perpetually in the temple and makes Aaron the first high priest between God and the people, that it's all in line consistently that all the way back here at Moses, God had already in his mind chosen the Levites as the tribe that were going to do this. Now it came about, verse 28, on the day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, that the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I am the Lord, speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I speak to you. But Moses said before the Lord, behold, I am unskilled in speech. How then will Pharaoh listen to me? Chapter seven then starts. Then the Lord said to Moses, see, I will make you as God to Pharaoh and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. Okay, we got to talk about two things there. It's really interesting language. The first is, I'm going to make you as God to Pharaoh. In other words, I'm not going to talk to Pharaoh directly. But it's going to reach the point where everything you say is going to come to pass. You're going to walk in and say, okay, that's it, frogs. And sure enough, they're going to be frogs. And Pharaoh's not going to come to me to ask that the frogs stop. He's going to have to come to you to ask for the frogs to stop. And then whatever deal you make, in fact, you're going to see Moses is actually going to say to Pharaoh, okay, just to show who's got the power here, what day would you like the frogs to stop? And even give him the chance to pick the day. And Pharaoh says, uh, tomorrow's good. And he's going to say, fine, tomorrow, the way you called it, tomorrow the frogs die. Sure enough, the next day, dead frogs everywhere. So in that way, God is saying, here's what I'm going to do for you, Moses. I'm going to make it so that you are like God to Pharaoh. And whatever you say is going to, in fact, take place because you're going to speak my words. So he's going to look to you as being a direct representative. But I'm going to make Aaron your prophet. So what does prophet mean in that setting? Is Aaron getting some kind of divine revelation straight from God that he's speaking at that moment? No, he's going to get his words from Moses who's going to get them from God. So in that case, the prophet means you're going to speak the words that God gave Moses, that Moses gave Aaron, and Aaron is now Moses' prophet, not God's prophet, which means you're going to speak the words Moses gives you to speak. So that helps us to get a sense of what the Bible means when it says the word prophet, because we see the word prophet and think, well, that's a guy who hears directly from God. That's a guy who speaks to the people from God, and he gets mystical Gnostic revelation, and then he speaks. And then you read in the New Testament, God gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And then you're going to read in 1 Corinthians 13, and he's going to talk about the different gifts that the body can have. And then he's going to say, but uh, rather than speaking in tongues, uh, you should rather seek to prophesy. And people get this image of, well, okay, does that mean... I should go to God to get a private revelation and then go prophesy? Is that what it means? Well, no, this helps us understand what it means. It means the one who speaks the word of God that has already been handed down by the apostles. Those who heard from Jesus originally, who said, this is what Jesus said. Now I'm passing it on to you. Now you're going to go and speak those things. That is a form of prophecy. There is a uh, colloquialism 
that says the essence of the word prophesy means to speak forth. And so they'll say those two words can become interchangeable in their order. In other words, sometimes if it's a prophecy of things that are going to happen, like if God says to Isaiah, there's going to be a king named Cyrus, and he's going to let the people go, well, that's forthtelling. That's speaking in advance. That's forthtelling what's going to happen. And that's legitimately called prophecy in the Old Testament. But then there's also times when you're telling forth. In this instance, Aaron is going to go say nothing new. Nothing he got directly from God. He's going to say what Moses told him to say. God's going to speak to Moses. Moses is going to speak to Aaron. And then Aaron's going to speak it. And that's called prophecy because it's telling forth. And so legitimately then he can say, Paul can say within the body of the church, that of the gifts that you should desire, that you should desire above all the other gifts, that ability to speak forth, which in that context means to tell the gospel. That rather than a self-affecting, self-raising demonstration of power, instead, he said, the gift that you should all hope to have is the opportunity to just speak forth the truth. But I'm talking about the preeminence that the Bible gives all the way through to speaking the word of God the way God said it. It kind of takes us back to the article I read at the beginning, Theology Matters. And so God says, here's my word, and he said it to the prophets, and the prophets wrote it down. And then when we take what God has said by the mouth of the prophets, and we then say it to other people, we spread that same word, that same gospel, that legitimately also falls under that heading of biblical prophecy. Does that help unconfuse that topic a little bit? Because it's said very clearly right here, Aaron will be the prophet of Moses. And so there are prophets that go beyond just prophet of God. Right? It means to say what the prophet of God has said. God speaks to Moses, Moses speaks to Aaron, Aaron speaks what Moses said, and in that way is legitimately the prophet of Moses. And so when we speak what the apostles have said, we are then the prophets of the gospel in that we are speaking forward the same word of God that God gave them to speak. Does that make sense? Did I lose anybody? Okay, good. Verse 2 then says, You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall speak to Pharaoh that he lets the sons of Israel go out of his land. So there's the order that I just described. God said, Moses, I'm going to speak to you. And then I'm going to tell you what to say. But then you're going to tell Aaron, and Aaron's the one that's going to speak for you, thereby he's your prophet. And by the way, it does say he's going to speak to Pharaoh. And uh, have you seen a movie yet that does it that way? Where Moses has the speech impediment and argues that he's not very good at speaking. And then Aaron is the one who actually says, let my people go to Pharaoh. Every movie, every story, every kid's Sunday school book says Moses goes and tells Pharaoh, let my people go. It's not the biblical way it's written. So your brother Aaron will speak to Pharaoh that he let the sons of Israel go out of his land. But here he says it again. This is just so redundant in a good way. This is so repetitive. God says, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Why? that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. God wants to demonstrate his power in the land of Egypt. And because he will get glory to himself, and he will demonstrate his power, and he will do it in such a way that we'll talk about it for the rest of humanity, he will also harden Pharaoh's heart. So, let's go back to Sam. We've already established that the Israelites... And I'm not picking on you. You just happen to be here. I'm not trying to force theology down your throat. But you seem to be like so tuned into what I'm doing right now. I know you're going to give the right answer as long as it's not drawing straws. And so, <laughs> so we've already established that the Israelites became God's people because God chose them. There's no way around that. But now you're stuck with God is going to get glory for himself and he's going to harden Pharaoh's heart. So then why does God harden Pharaoh's heart? For his glory. 
for his glory. Isn't that an astounding thing? It is. Awesome awesome. It's an awesome thing. Here you've got God saying, you see that guy? I raised him up and put him on the throne. I made him Pharaoh of Egypt. I'm in charge of all the kings of the earth. And I'm going to get glory for myself. And because I'm going to get glory for myself, I'm going to harden this guy until I punish him in ways I've never punished any people ever before. I'm going to work mighty wonders in Egypt that people are going to talk about forever. And for that reason, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. That's going to happen. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. I'm going to do that. Did Pharaoh have any choice? Nope. Did he say, if Pharaoh chooses to harden his own heart, then I'll agree with him and harden his heart? Clause Did, three, I don't know. No, <laughs> no, it's just not. Yes, ma'am. Well, I think it's especially good because Pharaoh is touted as divine. Oh, absolutely. He is a god, according to the Egyptians. The Egyptians worship Pharaoh as a god. As we're going to see as we go through some of these plagues as well, I've told you before, they had this whole pantheon of gods. And they had a god of like flies, and they had a god of locusts, and they had the sun god, and God is going to wipe out the sun for three days. I mean, that was their big god, Ra, the sun. So God's going to go, how about if I'm bigger than Ra and just wipe him out for three days? Every god they had is going to get laid waste in the course of these plagues while God goes, I'm the only god that is. And all your gods can't help you, can't save you. It reminds me very much of uh, Elijah going to the priests of Baal and saying, okay, you know, you, you get your god to call down fire. And then when you're done and I'm finished mocking you, then we'll pour water over my sacrifice and we'll see if I can get the real God to show up, which he does. I mean, God is very into demonstrating who he is and what his power is and that there are no other gods, even to the point of raising his son up out of the grave to say, look, I've never done that before. Nobody ever rose from the grave like that before and then sailed right up off the planet into the clouds with the promise he'd be back. I mean, God continually demonstrates I'm the only God that has this kind of power. It's a very consistent image of God. I will harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt when Pharaoh will not listen to you. Now contrast that to all the wills we read earlier. I will do this. I will, I will. I will be their God. They will be my people. I will redeem them. I will bring them to the land. I will, I will, I will. When it comes to Pharaoh's will, look at what he says. When Pharaoh will not listen to you, how can God say so emphatically, Pharaoh will not listen to you? How can he know that? Because he decreed it. Yeah, I mean, where is absolute libertarian free will at this moment? Because if it exists, then God can't say this. If God says he will not listen to you, and when he does not listen to you, he has to add the caveat, unless he chooses to. And I'm not really sure. He might. He might at any moment just decide to go ahead and listen, if there's any real, genuine free will. But the complete lack of free will allows God to say things like, and when Pharaoh will not listen to you, because I will harden his heart, so he's not going to listen to you. And when he does not listen to you, then I will lay my hand on Egypt. So what did God just say? I'm going to harden his heart so that he won't listen to you. And when he doesn't listen to you, I will lay my hand of judgment on Egypt. You've got to embrace that God because it's the only God you find in the Bible. You have to embrace the fact that that's how the real God of the Bible is. It's how he works. It's how he acts. And it's how he sees himself. You should not conceive of any other God of your imagination and place that on a pedestal ahead of this God. Because this is the only God you find in the Bible. And he's the God that declares, I'm God Almighty and I will do things. And I will, I will, I will. And sometimes you will not. And I know you will not. Because I'm the one that said, you will not. And he's the one that also said, you shall have no other gods before me. You'll have no other gods before me. Yeah. Even the ones you make up. <laughs> Even the ones you make up. And we're so good at that, aren't we? <laughs> we're so good at making up gods. 
I will harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. When Pharaoh will not listen to you, then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring out my hosts, my people, the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt by the great judgments. See the division there? I'm going to lay my hand on Egypt and I'm going to deliver my people. And I'm going to use great judgments against Egypt, but I'm going to bring out my people. Now, I began to say earlier that once you get to like even the, the third, fourth plague, you get into the frog area, lice, flies, that area, God is actually going to separate Goshen, the area that the Israelites are staying in, from the rest of Egypt. And when these terrible plagues come in, the plagues hit everywhere in Egypt except where God's people are. I, I mean, okay, I can almost explain in naturalistic terms that just maybe at this precise moment in time there was the worst locust plague that Egypt had ever seen. But locusts that knew not to go into Goshen? How do you explain that? There's no way to explain it beyond God just doing what God wants to do and separating between his people and those that are not his people. Verse 5, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. That's really, really interesting. Will their knowledge that he is the almighty God save them? No. So is it going to keep them out from under his hand of judgment? No. How are they going to know he's the real God? By his judgment. All his judgments and plagues are going to prove to them that he's the real God and that their gods are not the real gods. And so for folks out there who say, well, I believe in God in some very large general sense. And so I'm sure that when I die, the God that I believe in is the God I'm going to see. And the God I believe in is a big loving God who's going to know that I did my best down here. He grades on a curve. And he's going to know that nobody did particularly well. And so therefore, I'll probably be pretty good because so far, you know, I didn't kill or commit adultery much or I don't drink too much. You know, start listing their credits. I didn't inhale. All those excuses. The older folks in the room got that joke instantly. All the kids went, what's that? It's a former president. Never mind. Who may be back in the White House again real soon. So anyways... All right, so let's wrap up here. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I shall stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. There are plenty of folks who are going to say, I know God, I know God. I believe in God. I believe a God exists. I believe that there's enough proof in creation that some God exists. And then they're going to get there and they're going to be so surprised that that God says, depart from me, I never knew you. And I'm going to get glory for myself in my judgment of you. And they're going to say, that's not the way I conceived of you. I conceived of you as being much friendlier than that. And I can, I can just imagine God saying, did you see my universe? Did you ever take the time to walk outside and look up? Did you ever listen to those scientists talk about billions and billions of stars and planets and universes and black holes? Who do you think did all that? And you had 70 years on the planet of ignoring me and then making up some imaginary version of me. And now you're surprised when you get in front of me that I'm not impressed with you? You have this complete misconception of me where you think it would be unfair of me to judge you? Have you never read that whole Egypt thing? I've been in the getting glory for myself by judging people for the history of mankind. Are you familiar with a little thing I like to call the flood? Have you ever heard of that? I wiped out everybody for my own glory. and started out with eight people again. Are you not familiar with the whole, I sent my son, and everybody rejected him and nailed him to a piece of wood after they got done hitting him and spitting on him? And you had 70 years on the planet, and you walked around the whole time rejecting him. And now you're surprised that I would get glory for myself in judging you? God has always been that way, is my point. The only God you find in the Bible is exactly that way. And so if he's been kind to you, good to you, gracious to you, loving to you, 
If he has revealed himself to you, if he has shown you some of those Jehovah revelatory characteristics, if you've been brought into line where you actually love that God of the Bible, that wasn't you doing it. That is the grace of God doing it. Go back and say thank you to him because he's perfectly willing to show his wrath and he's perfectly willing to get himself glory in judging and he's also willing to get glory in being gracious. And if you are in one of those vessels of grace, then really in the big picture, that's all that matters. Everything else fades into a distant second behind God knows who I am and he loves me. Everything else comes in number two, but two is way back there. Verses six and seven, last two verses. So Moses and Aaron did it as the Lord commanded them, thus they did. And Moses was 80 years old and Aaron was 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. 80 and 83, and just then coming to grips with the real God. I guess never too late, huh? Of course, we know that Moses has got another 40 years of wandering in the wilderness ahead of him. He's probably tired at this point. Little does he know he's got all this walking ahead of him. Oh, and he's going to get tired of these people. Oh, the arguments he's going to have with these people. And it's not going to stop. These people are going to keep complaining and arguing and walking and complaining and God's going to keep proving himself and proving himself and proving himself. And then God's finally just going to say, okay, Moses, you don't get to go in. And the whole first generation that left Egypt, they're not going to get to go in. But it's going to be Joshua that leads them in and it's going to be the second generation that gets to go in. And one more time, we're going to see that younger of the two generations getting the promise continuing to create that same typology of the new covenant being superior to the old. All that stuff's coming. So uh, next week, we're going to see them go before Pharaoh and throw down a stick, and it's going to become a snake. And the magicians are going to show up and go, oh, we can do that, and throw down their sticks, and they're going to become snakes. And then something happens they didn't expect. Aaron's snake eats all the other snakes. They didn't see that one coming. So we'll get into that next week and get into the plagues and see God continue to be incredibly consistent. I'm God. I have all the power. I do whatever I want. I will, I will, I will, I will. And whenever he speaks of the will of his enemies, it's always, you will not believe. You will not come to me. You will not. So, but then way, Jesus spoke that way, didn't he, to the Pharisees? You will not come to me that you may have life. That's what your will is all about. Your will is negative. My will is good. So you had your hand up a moment ago, and I kept ignoring you for a moment. What's up? I was just going to say, would it be correct to say that no one and nothing could impress God? Is it correct to say that no one and nothing could impress God? Yeah, because for God to be impressed, it would mean that something happened that he didn't see coming or didn't ordain. It would be like God being taken by surprise. There's a colloquialism the preachers like to use, so I'll throw it out here and you can use it later. And it goes, uh, has it ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurred to God? So, yeah, it would be real hard to impress God. There's only one place in the whole Bible where a type of human being is eulogized, where it says God loves a particular kind of person. And that's when Paul writes that God loves cheerful givers. That's the only place where you find that there's a particular type or a particular kind of person that God eulogizes or is impressed by. But through the whole rest of the Bible, you read... God is no respecter of persons. And what that means is he doesn't care how important you think you are or how smart or fast you are. God's not impressed. Right? But then again, to be God, I mean, how much would it take to impress him? My goodness. You so, have to be his son. You have to be his son. Yeah, exactly right. All right, I need to let you go. Thank you for joining us for this week's lesson. If you would like more information about Grace Christian Assembly or the teaching of God's sovereign grace, please visit us on the World Wide Web at salvationbygrace.org.